The 1960s and 1970s was a time when artists began to challenge the commercialization of the art object and contest the gallery system that bestows a value upon it, raising questions not only regarding the nature of art, but also the role of the artist, attempting to expand the definition of both. While artists in Western Europe and North America used institutional critique to expose the hidden mechanisms at work in relation to art, in the Eastern Bloc, where most artistic production was subject to state control, these mechanisms were often not hidden, but overtly acknowledged and deliberately stated. Despite the lack of an art market in the region, artists in Eastern Europe many of whom traveled to and exhibited in the West, shared with those working their concerns regarding the institution. If we accept Alexander Albero's definition of institutional critique as a strategy to, quote, expose the institution of art as a deeply pro problematic field, making apparent the intersections where political, economic, and ideological interests directly intervened and interfered in the production of public culture, then we can see this as a shared practice between East and West's West, where institutions of art were equally problematic, if for different reasons. So while artists in the region adopted similar strategies to challenge artistic institutions and their power structures in general, these artists also adapted this critique to the particularities of the local situation, addressing, for example, the lack of institutional support for experimental art, or the bureaucracy of those institutions that did support it, the westernization or commercialization of culture, or the hegemony of the old order, be it socialist realism or socialist modernism, depending on the context. Artists in the East were equally critical of Western capitalism as they were of the implementation of state-sponsored socialism, and thus in their critique of power structures and bureaucracy, they were able to confront both systems. While I acknowledge that the term institutional critique can be problematic in this context, insofar as it was neither used contemporaneously by artists in the East or in the West, introducing these examples from the Eastern Bloc can nuance our understanding of the term. In my abstract for this paper, I raised the following question. Can institutional critique, as practiced by artists from Eastern Europe, be seen as a point of continuity, rupture, or development, or completely distinct and other from the West? And in my talk today, I will attempt to demonstrate my contention that it is, is all of these, that while institutional critique links artists working in the East and in the West, artists in the region, in the East, responded to both local and global circumstances affecting artists. So in my study of performance art in Eastern Europe, the book that I just finished, um, this charts the development and significance of the genre of performance, including happenings, actions, and body art in the region since the 1960s. And in this text, I look for these points of continuity and difference in order to demonstrate the manner in which performative art developed concurrently, uh, performative art forms developed concurrently with those in the West. I also illustrate points of continuity linking the socialist and post-socialist periods in order to bridge both East and West and past and present to break out of those binary models and produce a more global view of art from the region. By, sh by examining these shared practices and parallel concerns, as well as the particularities of those practices specific to their points of origin, I aim to demonstrate how the synthesis of local, regional, international, and global approaches and concerns point to a unique contribution by artists from Eastern Europe to performance art. And in this paper here, I focus on the particular theme of institutional critique uh, expressed through performative work. So while Michael Asher removed the wall of the Claire Copley Gallery in Los Angeles in 1974 to expose the office space behind the exhibition space, revealing the business of art and its economic underpinnings to the viewer, Czech artist Jan Mulchok opened that space even further in 1980 when he turned the exhibition space, uh, space of the De Apple Gallery in Amsterdam into a hostel. When offered to create an exhibition for the gallery, Mulchok reasoned that, quote, such a nice room in the middle of the city should be put to better use than for art, end quote. 
Munchok had experienced his own local form of institutional pressure during the normalization era in Czechoslovakia, when exhibition space was rarely available for experimental art practices, and much of his work took place in clandestine venues such as the basement of the Museum of Applied Arts in Prague or alternative spaces outside the capital or in the countryside. While Asher's critique may have been leveled at the business of art and its value system, Mulchok simultaneously addressed that issue targeting a Western gallery, along with his own local situation where a nice room in the middle of the city would probably not even be put to use for art, at least not uh, if it were experimental in nature. One year earlier in, oops, I lost a slide, okay. One year earlier in 1979, Yugoslav Croatian artist Mladen Stalinovic, oh no, there it is. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. So one year earlier in 1979, Yugoslav or Croatian artist Mladen Stalinovic gave a lecture and an anti performance at Dea Pil Gallery in the context of the Words and Works exhibition. According to the artist, this was one of the first manifestations of the East in the West. In honor of such an occasion, the artist gave his lecture entirely in Croatian without any translation and with the request that the video recording of the speech also remain untranslated. The artist defiantly countered the dominance of the Western art market and Western art canon, challenging its policies of exclusion by refusing to use English as a common language of communication. And I'm sure many of you know his, his well-known banner, an artist who doesn't speak English is not an artist, but was from later, from the 1990s. Um, the title of his lecture, The Discourse uh, About Language and About Power, implicitly connected the two, language and power, in the context of the Western art world and art market. The anti-performance was called the footbread relationship and in some ways illustrates this balance of power between the two entities, with the foot exercising its power over the loaf of bread, kicking it to crumbs. And there was an additional layer of his critique uh, specifically to the issue of performance art and its documentation. So he was supposed to actually perform the footbread relationship, but instead he just showed a picture of it. Or he actually, I think he approached the, he started to kick the bread and stopped before he actually kicked it. So it was also a critique of the institutionalization of performance art. While artists in Eastern Europe may not have had local art markets to contend with, their connections with artists abroad exposed them to concerns by their Western counterparts regarding the instrumentalization of art by the markets. And in the collision between these two experiences, we encounter unique forms of institutional critique. Ivana Bago has characterized the Yugoslav brand of institutional critique as nuanced, both, quote, anti-bourgeois and anti-capitalist, end quote. Because despite the fact that artists may have been distrustful of local governments, they were also sp suspicious of Western capitalism. And in places where there were institutions that supported contemporary art, for example, in Zagreb, artists often considered them to be just as corrupt and hegemonic as those in the West. Together with Antonia Maiazza, Bago has conceptualized the notion of the delayed audience for artists working in the East, indicating that those artists saw the viewership for work for their work um, as not necessarily the present one in the local envi environment um, outside of their, their close networks of friends. Um, I would like to extend this concept of de the delayed audience further to suggest that while a wider local audience may have been a future one, um, as the reception of their work now across the region now indicates, part of their work uh, that addresses larger global concerns regarding artistic organizations may have be been delayed geographically as well. Consequently, while this shared problematization of the institution addressed the local situation, these artists were also speaking to Western institutions in their system critique. Often a counter to the top-down management of the arts in Yugoslavia, self-organization offered opportunities to free oneself from these bureaucratic structures that impose limits on artistic creations and also fit perfectly with Tito's brand of self-management socialism. In Yugoslavia, it was not necessarily the ruling authorities that posed a threat to artistic freedom, but rather the artists themselves, both those of the older generation and those who enjoyed success under the regime. 
The Student Culture Centers established across Yugoslavia in the wake of the 1968 student protests allowed for the system of self-management that the country had advocated for its workers in which they would, uh, in which they would be responsible for the running of organizations. Dunja Blažević, director of the Student Culture Center Art Gallery in Belgrade from 1971 to 76, saw the center as a counterpoint to the art academy. In her words, quote, we didn't feel that the party or state politics presented an obstacle to do what we were doing, but we clashed in the domain of culture and art with the dominant tendency of modernism or socialist modernism, which was in power, end quote. While the student culture centers were partly state-funded and partly self-funded, partly organized by professional workers and partly volunteer and self-organized, they occupied a liminal position between state-supported and independent. Various other attempts at self-organization by artists can be seen across the block, as artists sought an alternative to even, um, to even these uh, semi-official or alternative institutions, as well as to the official mainstream cultural ones, for various reasons. Sonia Vekovic and Dalibor Martinez attempted to create a purely non-hegemonic autonomous art space with their collaborative, collaborative artist-run space called Podrum, the working community of artists from 1979 to 1980. Ivana Bago sees Podrum as an attempt to rescue self-management socialism, quote, detaching it from the state and practicing it in a non-bureaucratized, anarchistic, and solidary way, end quote. Respectively, Ivekovic feels that those active in the countercultural scene at the time, quote, took the socialist project far more seriously than the cynical governing political elite, end quote. And that statement really echoes a lot of things that I've read um, Kvik, uh, Zofia Kulik saying about that time as well and the institutions that um, she was, or he, her and Kvik Kulik were attempting to establish. So there's an interesting parallel there. Um, while they were aware of the focus of Western artists on the dematerialization of the art object, artists in Yugoslavia recognized this as an idea that shared a kinship with the socialist idea of society. The Gorgona group in Zagreb organized independent I exhibitions in the Shira frame shop in Zagreb or walks on Medvednica mountain, which they called footing, for the freedom it offered them from, institu from official institutions. Similarly, in um, 1971, Nena Balkovic Dimitrievich and Brazo Dimitrievich staged the first exhibition of conceptual art in Yugoslavia, quote, it was called At the Moment, in the main entrance hallway of an apartment building at 2A Frankopanska Street in Zagreb. Instead of exhibiting in a recognized art institution, the artist hijacked a public non-artistic space in order to attract and engage a non-art going public. They did this because they wanted to, quote, democratize art by leaving the circle of specialized, socially and educationally defined gallery spectators, end quote, and also to emancipate themselves from the gallery system in order to be able to show their works without depending on the annual program and exhibition policies of galleries. They did this by sending out letters to artists requesting artworks um, from artists such as Robert Berry, Daniel Buren, Victor Bergen, Yanis Konella, Solovit, um, Oho, and Goran Trubuliak, very similar to what Beke did uh, in Hungary. Um, so they circumvented the usually complicated procedures for selecting, procuring, and exhibiting works of art. Similarly, also in Zagreb, um, the group of six artists began organizing their exhibition actions in 1975, which took place across Yugoslavia, displaying their artworks on the streets, in courtyards, squares, on beaches, uh, and creating actions or happenings, creating artworks also in the public space. Their aim was mainly to gain contact with new audiences, uh, attract members of the non-art going public, and interact with their viewers directly through conversation. Even though these artists had the opportunity to exhibit in places such as the Student Center in Zagreb or the Gallery of Contemporary Art, art historian Branka Stepancic commented that these organizations were nevertheless problematic, restrictive, and selective with their own personal preferences and favorites. Consequently, artists looked to spaces outside the institution for complete freedom. Finally, in Sarajevo in the 1980s, the Zvono group utilized alternative venues such as shop windows and even a soccer field 
because they, there simply were no places for them to show the work of young experimental artists. Their work illustrates the tension often visible among artists in the East between criticizing the institution and the desire for it. If anything, the Zvono artists were trying to find their way into the institutions of art. And I find another parallel here with Kei Kulik, who were really trying to, in, in some ways, in, become part or create an institution. Um, Rasha Todosievich is one artist active in the Student Culture Center in Belgrade, whose work often takes the power structures of the art world to task. In a series of performances entitled Was ist Kunst, or What is Art, he ironized this unanswerable question by addressing it to the victim of his torture, who is always female and always silent. And in this example, it's actually his wife or partner, uh, Marinella Kogel. Um, so uh, in, her, in her reticence, she embodies what Dan Sertanovich has described as the, quote, passively masochistic attitude of a citizen who in a totalitarian regime loses his will, thus contributing to maintaining the repress repressive apparatus, end quote. By framing his interrogation in the context of art, the artist draws a parallel between artistic in institutions and totalitarian discourse. And while it appears that in this instance, the artist maintains control, yelling at, yelling at and abusing uh, the victim, it is the victim, in fact, who maintains a position of power by refusing to submit to the interrogation because she always remains silent. But either way, either way that you look at it, it's the artist who remains in control. So either it's Rasha Todosievich who is in control, um, exercising his will over the, the female, or if the, it's the female character that embodies um, this, uh, the answer to the question, then, and then she remains in power. So either way, you win, I guess. Um, Todosievich also attempted to control the discourse in Art and Memory, a performance wherein he recited all of the names of the artists he could remember in one sitting, dressed as a terrorist or hijacker of the artistic canon. Instead of submitting to it, he creates it rather than being relegated to the position of its subject. Art history becomes a, project, a trajectory that grows from within him. And this perfor performance establishes the young Serbian artist as its master, providing him the opportunity to take a central subject position. A similar gesture, <clears throat> excuse me, a similar gesture of control and even takeover can be seen in the work of Goran Tubuliak, who stuck his finger through the door of the Gallery of Modern Art in Zagreb several times and codified this action in a piece in entitled, From Time to Time, I Stuck My Finger Through a Hole in the Door of the Modern Art Gallery Without the Management's Knowledge. Here, it is the artist who decide what, decides what gets into the gallery and inserts himself without seeking permission or invitation from the gallery first, literally penetrating its walls and violating its policies of inclusion and exclusion. Although artists in Yugoslavia remained relatively insulated from market demands, they never lift, nevertheless craved acknowledgement, not necessarily um, financial, but just acknowledgement, I think, by um, art institutions, art historians, curators, as indicated by Todosievich's ironic statement that he failed to realize his dream of becoming a, quote, rich and fat artist. His Edinburgh statement presents an inventory, according to the artist, of all those who, quote, make a profit on art and who gains from it honestly, end quote. He lists hundreds of individuals, some obvious, galleries, gallery owners, publishers, critics, collectors, and others less obvious. For example, all those who produce and sell either wholesale or retail drugs, sanitary supplies and alcohol, contraceptives, cigarette, and sporting goods to artists. Some who he feels perhaps shouldn't, for example, those who earn or hope to earn from additional publications or reprints of the Dada movement, Fluxus, and so forth, though they didn't even dream of doing this when it was truly necessary for the artist. And then, of course, those who either turn art into a commodity or, or profit from the commodification of art, for example, souvenir producers and their salespeople. Notably absent from this list, however, is the word artist. These statements demonstrate the fact that the artists, in so, even in socialist Yugoslavia, primarily because of their connection connections with the West did not exist completely out of the market system. 
The performances of Dali Bormartini's also address the institution from a critical point of view, and I've just chosen one um, for the sake of time, suggesting a different model of relationships between artists and institutions. In work for Pump's Gallery at the Pump's Gallery in Vancouver, he used the act of painting to cover the walls of the gallery, painting them white in preparation for a new exhibition. The artist commented that this piece not only challenged the notion of the neutrality of the white cube, but also provided a situation for reciprocity and artistic collaboration. In Martini's words, this piece expressed, quote, the possibility for the work of one artist to be at the service of that of others. Exhibition, the white painted gallery was used for the exhibition of the works of other artists, end quote. Instead of competition among artists with the, which the institution instills, his piece promotes cooperation. In the post-socialist period, this critical art takes on new forms and strategies as without state-sponsored in infrastructure for art, artists were suddenly forced to enter into and experience more vividly the art market. Consequently, institutional critique exists as a point of continuity that also bridges the socialist and post-socialist periods, as well as East and West. If anything, the ghettoization of artists from Eastern Europe by Western art institutions, historians, and critics after 1989 has created a new opportunity for a reassessment of these systems. In some ways, artists from the East who, had, who take the institution of art to task can be seen as operating in the, the lacuna left by Western artists from the 1960s and 70s who failed to address the issue of the division of the art world into East and West in their institutional critique. Attempts at self-organization and in institutional independence con continued after the system change. Working together on a project called Weekend Art Hallelujah the Hill, Alexander Batista Illich, Ivana Kayser, and Tomislav Gotovac created a long durational artwork that existed for quite some time outside of the art institution. In 1995, the three started taking walks up Slamia, the highest peak of Medvednica, the, which the Gorgona group had also frequent, frequented. The walks started simply as walks without any artistic or other intention. During the, t the course of the 10 hours of the day, the trio would hike, wander, swim, have picnics, and most importantly, talk. These weekly walks and conversations later became codified as an artwork once curators and art historians heard about what they were doing. Illich has described the significance of these walks and conversations as being about the gesture, noting that the actual exchange of experience that the three shared was very important. The piece was as much about merging, uh, the merging of art and life as it was about escape the escape to the mountain, away from the politici politicization of art and life during and after the war, as well as an escape to, from an art world that had moved away from the ephemeral and conceptual in order to return to painting in the 1980s and 90s. He notes that what is exhibited of these weekend walks, the photographs of the three artists, is only about 2% of what the artwork work actually is. Mladen Miljanovic from Banja Luka, Serbia, considers uh, part of his role as an artist to be at the service of the viewer, echoing Martinez's earlier ideas about art being there to serve others. In Taxi to the Museum, he literally provided a service by offering a taxi service that would take uh, viewers to and from the Museum of Modern Art in Vienna, where he had a solo exhibition at the time. For this seven-day performance, the artist was available by cell phone to pick up and drop off any passenger who wanted to visit the museum, making art useful, much, much like Mulchok did in his hostel. The artist wanted to fill the space in between the moment when a person leaves his home to embark on a trip to the museum and when he actually enters it, populating that space as an artistic experience, further bridging the gap between art and the everyday world. At the same time, however, he occupies the space of a major Western museum with an exhibition. So just like Martini's, he challenges this notion of competition and tension in art, while nevertheless positioning himself from within that institution to level his critique. 
In Perpetuum Mobile, uh, Croatian artist Sinisha Labrovic challenges not only the institutions that govern and select artists, but the neoliberal system in which they operate, suggesting that artists nowadays must be self-sustaining. The performance was created in response to several requests for him to perform for free. Since he had to work without pay, he devised a performance that he could use to feed and sus sustain himself and exist outside of market forces. During the piece, the artist attempts to urinate into his mouth. When he ultimate, ultimately fails, he uses his hand to cup the urine and drink it. So his action is really a futile attempt to support himself. The institution that is perhaps most emblematic of hierarchical uh, Western hegemony within the art world is the Venice Biennale. Following the regime change, ma many countries had difficulty organizing competitions to send artists or even selecting them or financing their exhibitions. So often countries from the Eastern Bloc remained, uh, remained unrepresented, unrepresented. In 1997, Kosovar Albanian artist Sisley Chafa hijacked the Venice Biennale, creating a mobile clandestine pavilion by walking around the city with an Albanian flag, kicking a football, dressed in the uniform of the Albanian national football team, uh, with a tape recorder broadcasting an Al Albania-Italy soccer match. The performance proposed a non-pavilion in a world of non-people, equating the lack of a national pavilion in Venice with, a, with the status of non-citizen or non-person in the art world. And of course, there are other political implications there as well. While his interloping enables him to critique the Biennale's politics of inclusion and exclusion, he nevertheless participates in it. Much like Serbian artist Tanja Ostojic, who followed curator Har Harald Scheman around during the opening of the 49th Venice Biennale, dressed in couture, rema also remaining silent, like uh, Todosievic's victims, in a piece entitled I'll Be Your Angel. Although she didn't speak and acted primarily as, as an escort for the male cur curator, uh, and he, she did this completely with his agreement, um, she artfully gained access to one of the most prestigious art events of the year. In this piece, she challenged both the lack of access to Western institution by Eastern European artists and access for women artists, adding a feminist critique to her institutional one. And this is actually one piece in a series um, uh, from her curator series, Strategies for Success. So there are other works that also address this issue too. Similarly, and much in the way that uh, Trubuliak had penetrated the modern art gallery in Zagreb, Lithuanian artist Arturos Raila created his own subversive act in 1997 at the Contemporary Art Center in the center of Vilnius in a work entitled, Once You Pop, You Can't Stop. Ryla commissioned a group of bikers from the motorcycle club Crazy in the Dark to drive through, uh, to drive into and through the CAC. With this action, he literally brought the extra artistic world into the gallery, forcing open its doors to the general public. Here, Ryla comments not only on the institutional policies with, with regard to artists, but also to its elitism toward the public and alienation of audiences. Although artists in the Eastern Bloc were perhaps somewhat sheltered from the constraints of the art market, their international connections mean that the institutionalization and commercial, commercialization of art was a shared concern that cut across the border between East and West. Their work often demonstrated the tension between critiquing the institution and the desire for it, as well as local is issues such as the hegemony of traditionalism, and the problems inherent in the implementation of self-management socialism or, or uh, socialism in, in also in Central Europe. Um, in the post-communist period, the, the need for institutional critique has perhaps become more vital as artists work to navigate both the Western art market and the local infrastructure, which is also often non-existent or only in development. Of course, that varies from, from place to place as well. Insofar as neither socialism nor ne neoliberalism offered sufficient support for the artists or support that, that they saw sufficient, these concerns are shared both geographically and temporally. Institutional critique is just one method by which artists in Central and Eastern Europe were inextricably connected, connected with global concerns regarding the mechanisms at play in the art world, yet also contributed their own unique forms and strategies of system critique. Thank you.